Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Brecken Branchtrader, and I'm the Senior Editor, Gemstones, at National Jeweler. I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest episode of My Next Question, National Jeweler's new webinar series sponsored by RDI Diamonds. Today's session is hosted by our Editor-in-Chief, Michelle Graff, and features Emily Fredericks, Internet Sales Specialist and Instagram Content Creator at Lang Antiques, and Kathy Calhoun, owner of Calhoun Jewelers. Before I turn it over to Michelle to get the webinar started, I just wanted to let our attendees know that if they have a question, they can type it into the Zoom Q&A box. I will be back on at the end to dis of the discussion to share the questions. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the National Jeweler website on Friday. Now we'll turn it over to Michelle, Emily, and Kathy, and I'll be back to field any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Brecken, and thank you to Emily and Kathy for being with us here today. I think we just might have lost Kathy. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, you hopefully. Did, but I hear you. Okay, Kathy's Kathy's with us in audio. We don't have her on video right now. Um, I just wanted to say a, a couple words about why I chose to do this before we get started here today. So. Um, over the years of National Jeweler, I've done quite a few the history behind articles. I've covered morning jewelry. I've covered uh, squ the squ squash blossom necklace, many different topics. But this year marks 100 years since the passage of the 19th Amendment, which prohibited um, people being denied the right to vote on account of sex. So it was a women's right to vote 100 years ago. I believe it was exactly August 18th, 1920 that the 19th Amendment was ratified. So that's why we're doing suffragist jewelry right now. So I want to start with a question to our two panelists. And Emily, I'm going to throw it to you first. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal experience with suffragist jewelry, how you came to learn about it, uh, why you like it, etc.? So basically, I've kind of gone about it all backwards. I stumbled, <laughs> I stumbled upon suffragist jewelry quite Recently, I'd heard about it in passing and kind of heard some of the myths around what it is and why it is. Um, but I do, part of what I do is the social media for Lang and we have a nice big audience. So I wanted to bring something historical um, into the, the context of our Instagram and share things that people might not know about jewelry, um, which is great because I get to learn at the same time. So I'm very much a student of suffragist jewelry now. Um, and I basically, I've been just pouring myself into researching it. We've featured um, the common misconceptions and uh, celebrated suffragette jewelry on our Instagram. And now I think kind of running with it and seeing how, how much we can learn and what we can do with it. And you're at Lang Antiques, is that right? Yes, I'm at Lang Antiques and I'm physically here now. This is not my home. <laughs> No, no, I meant your Instagram handle yes. is at Lang Antiques. <laughs> oh, yes, okay. at Lang Antiques. <laughs> okay, all right, and you are also at Lang Antiques. Yes, so I wish good. this was my um, living room. <laughs> I've done a little peeking at your Instagram. I think it's, I loved what you did over the summer with the suffragist jewelry, and for anybody that wants to still go and look, Lang actually has that saved at the top of their grid. You know, there's little circles where you can put things in a bucket. There's a name for this. I don't know what it is, um, but anybody wants to go check it out, at Lang Antiques on Instagram, they have the, all their Insta or their, all their suffragist jewelry content kind of saved up there. Now, Kathy, I want to talk to you about your history with suffragist jewelry as well, because you're actually the one that introduced me to it. And I don't know if you remember this, but I ran into you at the antique show in Vegas a couple years ago when it was still at the Paris. So this might have been like three, four years ago. And you told me you were looking for suffragist jewelry, and I'd never heard of it. You're like, it's this, remember. this, I always, do you remember that? Sure, sure, we had a good so time. We, <laughs> we did, I think we had lunch. Um, <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about how you became, uh, how you came to know about it and kind of like your history with it? Well, my history with it was, of course, my, my grandmother was a suffragette. And now I didn't oh. know, at the time, of course, I knew nothing about the jewelry. And all I knew is she had a little ribbon that was in her jewelry box that she had saved. But uh, as I got into the jewelry business and became interested in the estate and the period jewelry, I started to attend antique jewelry camp that used to be held at the University of Maine. And uh, the gentleman that put it on, his name was Dr. Joseph Sadiloff, who ran that, um, 
sort of the whole antique education. And he specialized in Art Nouveau jewelry and wrote a great book on it uh, that I think you can still get today. It's very interesting. But he's the first one that sort of turned me on and explained to me uh, what suffragette jewelry was because it overlapped at that time frame of the Art Nouveau style and the arts and crafts movement. It was around that time. So he piqued my interest in it. Okay, well, that's really, that's really, really cool. Um, so as I mentioned, Kathy, you're kind of the one who introduced me to suffragist jewelry. So when we're talking about suffragist jewelry, we're obviously talking about jewelry worn to make a political statement. I believe that women should have the right to vote. But the suffrage movement in the United States uh, started long before 1920. The date I see most often given is 1848. So we're talking about a movement that was at least seven decades in the making. Is it known kind of went along this timeline that suffragist jewelry started popping up? Because it probably it wasn't made the whole seven decades, correct? Correct. Is that for Emily? Emily, you take it. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> so most of the suffragette uh, jewelry that I've come across. I feel like the most information available is the jewelry that had to do with the WSPU, which was the Women's Social and Political Union, and they were actually in the United Kingdom. Um, but there was a lot of crossover of different activists traveling to the United States and um, people from the U.S. traveling there and kind of understanding their movement together and then working, working with that and taking it as inspiration. Um, but the WSPU, um, they're the ones that had the official colors of the purple, white, and green. They were from 1903 to 1918, um, and they didn't actually adopt the colors, which I think is what's most um, recognizable um, about the suffragette movement. Um, they adopted that in 1908, so it was really 1908 to 1914. It's kind of, from my research, what I understand is the sweet spot in the context of at least British suffragette jewelry. I know there's, there's gonna be many other facets, but that's really what I've been able to focus on. And Kathy, have you, do you have any research about the dates? Have you come across kind of the same thing? I've come across the same thing. You know, the way the uh, earlier uh, pins were mostly of uh, when the women were um, imprisoned and they had been given medals then when they had gotten out of prison. So uh, they were the early on pieces, but I never come across those. Do you, Emily? I almost never see I them. have. I have never. Um, I would l absolutely love to. <laughs> um, I actually have pictures of some of those medals that I can share. Um, oh yeah, that would be great. About yeah. it, if yeah. you wanna give me just one moment you know, uh, bars and chains. I mean, just yeah. showing that women were imprisoned because of their beliefs. Exactly. So Of only wanting to vote. <laughs> yeah, how crazy of us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Emily's going to share her screen here. Hopefully, let's see. There, you, hopefully you can see. Yes, yeah, we can um, see. So we have... Um, Emmeline Pankhurst, who was the founder of the WSPU, which was known as a very militant group. Um, they, were, they were really getting out there, which was quite shocking for everyone to see a bunch of um, essentially well-off white women going <laughs> out and uh, stirring things up with quite a lot of violence and, and different demonstrations. But so her daughter, I believe it was Sylvia Pankhurst, her whole um, mm -hmm. family was involved as part of the leaders. She designed the Holloway prison brooch, um, which is the brooch right here um, that features their colors. It has, it's, it's called a, a portcullis, I believe, um, which this was the, the gate to the House of Commons. Um, but it also, it reminds me of prison bars, kind of like the drawbridge that comes down. Uh, and then the arrows, there's a lot of arrows um, symbolism, at least in the British suffragette jewelry, because they actually have arrows on their prison uniforms at the Holloway prison. Um, so you can see that's actually 
Emmeline in uh, prison, and that was their prison uniform. And then they also have, um, you see the medal here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the, the medal, let's see, hold on. Um, they, they had medals of, you know, kind of gallantry for the hunger strikes. Um, it's, when they were in prison, uh, they, they started to, uh, let's see. There was hunger strikes in terms of, I'm sorry, give me one second. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the, the medals the they would receive a bar, yeah, the, the ribbon yeah, birch, they would receive that, a yeah. bar every time that they were in prison and the hunger strikes in prison, if you've seen recently the movie with Meryl Streep suffragette, there's a very graphic depiction of um, how absolutely awful um, the force feeding during the hunger strikes was. And I found that very moving, that entire movie really kind of drove home the, the fight that these women were putting up. It wasn't just marching and demonstrating. Um, it, it was very much a physical, a physical thing. But so they wore their medals with pride and they come out and everyone would be celebrating their release from prison. And um, there's all sorts of commemorative medals and jewelry that they would be presented with when they left the prison. Now, let me ask you about this, this hunger strike medal here. We don't know who this belonged to. You know, I actually have seen this, a similar image of it in it's a little like presenting case. And I believe the case had the name on it. So I think it is known whose this was, but I just didn't get the full image. So I could definitely go back and look for it if anyone is interested. <laughs> and I think what this bro what this medal says to me is, is this person was involved in three separate hunger strikes, one that lasted four months, one that lasted three months, and one that lasted six weeks. Am I reading that right? Yes. So yes. you got a kind of a bar on your medal, kind of like a military thing. You got a bar on your medal for each separate time you refused food, you went on a hunger strike. A bar exactly. of honor, can you imagine? Yeah. yeah it's it, it just really, it, it blows my mind, I think, seeing, um, seeing the images, too, of how just awful that must have been and how much conviction and passion. For many, many had. years. Think yeah. How long that went on. And, you know, being in prison multiple times, I, I can't, I can't yeah. quite imagine. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so we're talking a little bit about, um, it was waking when it came up, we're talking about the time span of when it was created. And Kathy, do you, I have an image, uh, Emily, if I could show an image mm -hmm. from Kathy. Um, Kathy, I want you to talk a little bit about this piece that you sent in to me. It's a suffragist piece that you sold. Yes. Um, uh, this, this was, I would, I dated this approximately around 1916 to 1970 or I mean 18, oh my gosh, wait, 1916 to 1917. And it was delicate and the enameling was so well done. As you can see, uh, and this is a good sign of a great suffragette piece and how you can tell if it's uh, original or reproduction by how well the enameling is done and the colors will flow into each other. And uh, you'll find tool marks, you can tell it's mostly handmade and delicate and romantic because the suffragettes did not want the stigma of being rough and tough. They still wanted to um, show that they were women and they were feminine and they wanted their jewelry to look like that. And this is one of the nicer pieces I've gotten. And you sold this piece? Yes, my accountant's wife wears this. And she, <laughs> and she wears it on special occasions. And uh, because of the great story with it, she tells everyone. She just loves, you know, it's all about the story. And, and she's, she's proud of it. She loves it. And she has two daughters. And they, both daughters fight over who's going to get it when she passes. <laughs> 
that's a common story with jewelry, right? Yeah. Um, how, but how do you, how do you, how are you certain? Because I think we're going to get into this a little bit later, but Emily, there's, there is this misconception that every piece was green, uh, purple, and white from this time of suffragette jewelry, and that's not, that's not necessarily true. But Kathy, how can you be sure? Is there any kind of engraving on the back of this or anything? Or do you know uh, who it belonged to or why they wore it? I, I knew nothing. I have no uh, provenance on this piece at all. But I could tell by how it was made. You could tell it wasn't new. It was made in that time frame. You know, there were tool marks on it. Uh, and as you get to know estate or antique jewelry, it does have a feel and a look to it, especially when you, you look at the back of the piece. You just you can you will learn that if it's a reproduction new, or if it's original to the time period, the pearls were still all original. Yeah, it's a gorgeous piece, and it I, you mentioned earlier Art Nouveau, and it certainly has that Art Nouveau look about it. It, it does, doesn't it? I mean, it's just very sexy, very sexy. And Michelle, can I ask you one thing? It yeah, says. Sure. It says my video will not work because the host has stopped it. Can oh, I, I don't know. I, okay. that's maybe maybe oh, Susan can fix that in the background. Okay. I'm actually Thank not you. the host, but maybe oh, Susan God. can fix that in the background. Okay, um, okay I'm going to stop sharing that now. So I, I just alluded to a little bit, but uh, Emily, I, I want to talk about the colors a little bit. So okay. um, I, as with any antique jewelry, there are obviously misconceptions about what constitutes suffragist jewelry. One of the biggest myths is what I just mentioned has to do with color, which in jewelry translates to gemstones. So Emily, can you explain about the color, color myth surrounding suffragist jewelry? So it was really the WSPU um, that they had great essentially branding, their whole um, campaign they wanted you to be able to recognize them from a mile away they were not quiet about their cause um, so they decided to utilize purple white and green um, and they're actually quoted as saying in one of their many publications um, that purple is the royal color it stands for the royal blood that flows in the veins of every suffragette and the instinct of freedom and dignity um, white stands for purity in private and public life, and green is the color. I know, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> and green is the color. It was of, a different. It was a different time. <laughs> yeah, so you know, you're still like coming from the Victorian values. You know, it wasn't just this immediate um, jump. And green is the color of hope and the emblem of spring. Um, and so, and so this whole thing that the color stood for "Give Women the Vote" or whatever the acronym I've heard is not true. They picked right, their colors based on what the hues, kind of like the connotation of the hues. Exactly. Not because it was an acronym. Exactly. I think it was easy to make that jump because of Victorian acrostic jewelry, where there was right. explicit messages being um, spelled out with the different colors of jewels. And that's a fantastic, fascinating whole avenue to go down. And, you know, there's always overlap in jewelry, people looking back, people looking forward, um, and people right in the middle. Um, but essentially, I think it's a misinterpretation over, over history. Um, they never said give women votes. Um, that kind of is implied, like, we'll let you vote. Like, their, their whole fight was like, we, we, are, we deserve the right to vote, we're equal, this isn't like a give us a privilege type thing. They said votes for women. Um, so, but green, violet, white, you, you can use the first letters and that would make you think you give women vote, but it just, that's not, I haven't found any evidence and neither has any of the, you know, historians that have really in depth, done in depth research, um, found anywhere where that's founded, at least at the time. Um, so it was really, it was purple, white, and green. You, you could see all of your, you know, you'd wear the colors um, and you'd, you'd dress like a lady, you'd basically be wearing your best. I think there was a quote saying that the suffragettes were almost like outspending what <laughs> they could afford so that they were always looking fabulous because there was an incident with the 
the bloomers in the US that kind of made a, a laughing stock of the women's rights movement and they were like, no, we're gonna be we're gonna be fabulous, feminine, cutting edge fashion and we're also give us the vote. <laughs> or um, well, it's kind of like yeah, the, votes for women. <laughs> I mean, it goes back to what you're saying about like the white, the purity, and what Kathy, you were just saying about like they still like to look feminine, they still like to look lovely, even mm -hmm. if it was, you know, mm -hmm. even if they were out marching for a cause. Um, and I want to touch a little bit on this too, Kathy. Do you have anything to add about color before we move on? Uh, no, color is uh, those three colors are a good way to identify the pieces during that period which is wonderful that, you know, when in the beginning, when they first started, it was the colors were enameled, maybe similar to how we see the American flag pins that we are wearing, you know, we wear today or every, it was very popular. It's September 11th when that happened. And, um, but they also had their little flag pins of the purple, white and uh, green. So it just carried through even making their, sashes out of those colors to add, to really make them stand out. If they're all on the street and they wore white a lot, a lot of white dresses, they would put the colors of the, sa of their colors of the sash on. It was, uh, and the colors do go great together. Yeah, I think when Emily's going to show it, us, Emily's going to show us uh, some of these color combinations. And I agree, like I've been looking a lot of pictures of these jewelry, this jewelry and purple, green and white do go really nicely together. Emily, did you want to show some more examples? Yeah, I actually have a bunch of examples of the different um, tin and celluloid buttons. I actually have a little fact right here. In 1896, oh, um, they perfected the technique to create celluloid buttons. Um, so they were able to mass produce colorful and inexpensive um, little bits uh, sorry, I'm just figuring out how to show this to you. And you know, um, the sad thing, oops, while you're I was looking, gonna I was say, um, a little bit more about the colors as well. There were so many different um, groups of women and men that were fighting for women's rights and for the suffrage movement, and pretty much every single one of them was having it, they had their own color scheme. So the, the WSPU kind of pioneered the purple, green, and white, which was, it was adapted by um, different groups in the US. And um, I think other people were doing a variation of, I saw purple or maybe it was red and purple. It, basically any combination that usually purple was pretty constant. In the US, they had purple, white and yellow um, and I believe the yellow stemmed from a sunflower being utilized because it was the state flower of I want to say Kansas I don't remember if that's correct um, but that sounds, that sounds good we'll, we'll say it is but don't quote me on that <laughs> um, but the I think it, it's still the, the white dress with the colorful sashes was the the prominent look of the movement and if you'll give me a second i will figure out how to bring it back up after it disappeared certainly uh, uh, uh kathy while she's pulling that up did you have something you wanted to add there oh i forgot that already <laughs> <laughs> that's okay <laughs> no i think what i wanted to comment what i wanted to comment about is you know the during the art nouveau period where we have those colors on that jewelry so few exist today when you think about it. And I think through all the decades of melting down gold, you know, as gold raises, people melt the jewelry down. And it's such a shame because so much of the suffragette jewelry is gone. Right. Well, I think one thing that we should probably point out is, and this might be a reason so much of it is gone, is that not too long after obviously 1920, they got to write the vote. Nine years later, the US was in the Great Depression. So there was probably some amount of that jewelry that was melted down, just like we saw people, Kathy, of course, you remember, and Emily, I'm sure you do too, 
when the Great Recession started in 2008 and the price of gold went sky high, people mm-hmm. needed the money. And that, you know, that unfortunately happens. And so, you know, this was only a decade, less than a decade, actually, before the Depression started. So, you know, maybe some of that jewelry got lost to that. Um, mm-hmm. Before we start looking at that, I want to ask one more question, and then Emily will jump into these images. I've also read some, there's also this misconception that women wore this jewelry to like send a secret code, like I'm supporting rights to vote and they sent it as a secret message to other women. But it's my understanding that they weren't secret about it. And these, like this jewelry was worn loudly and proudly and they weren't trying to hide from people the fact that they were suffragists. It wasn't an underground movement, so to speak. Yes, I learned that too, yes. I've seen, I've definitely seen there's a romantic notion that i mean obviously some women were in in awful conditions at home and probably were not feeling safe enough to voice their opinion we can never discount that and they probably have not been documented the same way as the the loud the loud and proud um uh women of the movement were but from everything i've read there's no like there's no evidence that they wore it in secret as a secret message i think yeah. you saw someone with the colors you were like yeah okay but they were also popular right. colors at the time um so presumably if they have become so associated with the movement you wouldn't really be putting on the colors unless you wanted to be associated with the movement but the color combinations were definitely already out there as well so it's a we don't know for sure, <laughs> but probably not. <laughs> you know, I have and grown to love those colors in that jewelry, though. Haven't, hasn't everyone else? Oh. Yeah, they're gorgeous. And Emily has some more examples she's going to show later um, of just how, how great those colors look together. But Emily, what we're looking at here on the bottom are the celluloid, celluloid buttons you mentioned that were 1896, did you say, is when they started mass producing those? Right, and so I, I believe, I don't know the exact time period on these particular buttons. I believe these bottom buttons are all from the U.S. Um, you can see in one they've adopted the colors of the, the WSPU, um, but then you can see there's also an enamel bro- uh, pin right here, Votes for Women, and that, I, it looks red, but I assume that was originally purple. Um, and then above that, you actually see, I chose this image, this is actually on the end, one of the Pankhurst women I recognize immediately, um, but they're, they're in their finery, that was kind of their, their marching dress. Um, a lot of- Looks very comfortable. <laughs> a lot of the, um, the women in at least the WSPU movement, they would wear portraits of their the leaders of the movement with the ribbons they would just wear the portrait of that's Emily Pankhurst like we follow her and so I found that really interesting they didn't really do that in the U.S. they weren't really idolizing the heads of the movement like they were in um, the U.K. but we I also seen I've only seen it in one article mentioned but I, I had to grab it the silver hat pin in the shape of a, a prison convict's arrow. Um, if you remember at the beginning, they had arrows on their convict uniforms, which is, I find fascinating, which I guess was the status quo. So anything with the arrow is kind of like a nod to um, fighting for the cause and being ready to go all the way for the cause, being imprisoned. And then the funny thing, remember the, the, uh, uh, they would not allow women then to have hat pins longer than nine inches because they would use them as weapons. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. They were sure these women were going to use them as weapons, pull them out of their hats. I mean, you know, Why not? They, they were throwing, <laughs> they were blowing, uh, blowing up, I believe there was a church and empty estates. They were throwing rocks through windows. They were, you know, lighting things on fire. This is, you know, <laughs> violence it has always been associated with um, strong movements and it, it has, it's right. really moved history forward. That's for sure. It's, it's nothing new. Right. That's very, very true. Um, do we want to look at your other slide or do you want to come back to that later? Um, it's up to you. 
I'm trying to remember. Oh, well, these were just examples. I've really been interested. I'm like, okay, I get the idea of a whole of suffragette jewelry, but I want to see real examples. And some of the most documented examples are hardly documented at all. This was, um, I'm forgetting her name, but I would, I'd be love to link the article for anyone interested. Um, but she took the time to look at these portraits of some of the leaders of the movement. So on the left, you have Flora Drummond, who I believe she was the one of the only working class um, leaders in the movement. She was not part of the middle. hunger strike. Yeah, um, and so she, <laughs> what was that? She was not part of the hunger strike. Oh, <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. She's got the, she has the medal. I can't She has see. the medal. Mm -hmm. Yes, this was a painting commissioned um, later. Um, I guess there's a very strong movement. Um, I think she was in Scotland, I want to say. Um, but this was a, a portrait commissioned by uh, other women in the movement after the fact. And you can see she's pretty much like presenting how proud she is of her mm -hmm. pieces. It's always interesting what pieces are painted in paintings because that's deliberate. That wasn't just they happen mm -hmm. to be wearing right. that. Um, right. So she's got her She's got her, you know, Medal of Valor. I, so she, that tells me she probably was in prison at some point. Um, and then she has this necklace that is very much typical of the arts and crafts movement that was the all the rage at the time period, which was where they were going away from the machine made industrial um, ex explosions that were have explosion of jewelry um, and, and focusing on um, the handmade. And so they were using cabochons and kind of in hand in hand with the Art Nouveau movement. It wasn't all these big, fancy, faceted, sparkling gems. It was, it was very kind of earthy. So you can see there's the colors of this necklace here. Um, and she's also wearing it in another photo where it's very clear that it was probably presented to her. Um, and then, <laughs> hi Starla. And Starla's, <laughs> Starla's actually one of our, uh, lead researchers here at Lang. So she's very interested. And then in the other photo, uh, we have Emmeline Pankhurst, who was well documented being presented a necklace. And the researcher thinks that it was probably the necklace in this photo. You can definitely see that there was pearls. Um, and it uh -huh. seems that pearls were mostly what was used to represent the white. And then this is actually a picture of her being presented with the necklace at one of their meetings. But, and the necklace has been described as being oops, um, super, you know, beautiful and luxurious. And she actually even said, um, Kathy, earlier, I think you said that children were like fighting over who's going to inherit something. Mm -hmm. Emily was like, this is so beautiful. Like, I can't wait for my children to inherit it. Um, and so she's wearing it proud and seen wearing it in a lot of photographs. But we don't know who made it. <laughs> Neither right. of these, we don't know who made it. The only ones we know who made them, we can come back to that. Well, Kathy, I don't know, I might be jumping ahead too far. Kathy, this necklace that uh, uh, Emmeline, is it Emmeline Pankhurst? I think it's yes. Emmeline, Emmeline, but I, I, I had looks, to look at the YouTube videos. <laughs> looks kind of similar to the necklace you we showed from you, the one that you said you sold to your accountant's wife. It, yes. remi it reminds me of that same of that style, very feminine. Yes. It's really beautiful. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Okay. I, I wonder where it is today. I'm sorry. I don't know. That's what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder I know. where it is if today. If someone has any of these pieces, that would just be so incredible. Yeah. And the, the article that I got the bulk of this really juicy information on <laughs> from is by Elizabeth Goring. Um, and you can download it in d various um, scholarly websites. Um, but I'd be happy to share it because this was the only article that I was just like, oh my God, someone actually really took the time, went through the primary, all the primary sources and they found this. And it, it's really, it's got me so excited. Um, so the bulk of what I've truly learned has been from this one article. Um, and so I pulled most of these images from her article. Which is Did you say Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren wrote the article? Elizabeth Goring. Oh, okay. Okay, no longer confused. G O R I N G. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, 
Just and so there clarity. was, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm going on too long about this, but there was no, the other most documented, yeah, the a very documented um, moment in terms of the jewels because most of it wasn't as documented as we would like it to be right now. Um, they, <laughs> there wasn't, oops, there was no tabloids going, well, she wore this by this designer. Um, right. Uh, <laughs> so we on the left you have Miss Cristobal Pankhurst, which is Emmeline's daughter. You can see she's wearing um, an enameled piece, and she's wearing this in several photos. So it's definitely an important piece to her. She's also wearing it in painting to the right. Um, the we don't know exactly who made it or what the depiction is, but we can kind of infer that it's very similar to the one in the center which was by um, Ernestine Mills, who was an enamelist um, at the time period, who's also a suffragette. And she was making pieces, um, in particular this medal above, which she presented to the suffragette Louise Eats um, to commemorate her imprison imprisonment. And so you can see in the enamel, it's an angel. There's something there's a really great description of it online and it said something about the stars being the oppressive patriarchy and um, <laughs> all these different elements that I was like, this is great. I need to spend more time looking at this, but you can kind of see um, in the corner too, it's the window of the jail, but it reminds me of the portcullis brooch of the Holy prison. Um, so I just got so excited when I found this. Um, and then we also know in that photo, you can see her brooch, which has all of the colors. Um, and it was probably by C.R. Ashby. And so, so most of the jewelers that were making pieces for these women, because they were definitely buying jewelry, um, were like very small artisans that were doing it mostly in the Art Nouveau style, or sorry, the arts and crafts style, um, and the the women that were in the guilds and the trades were large parts of the movement, which is, which makes sense. You always think of artists as like the movers and the shakers. They were very right. involved, um, I think, on both sides of the pond um, <laughs> in the suffrage movement. So, and then the last example that I have, wrong way, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so we do know that there was some jewelry that was specifically retailed um, for the suffragettes, and I looked for this image for so long in the center because everyone mentions that, I think it's Mappin and Webb. Um, right marketed jewelry towards the suffragettes in their Christmas catalog of 1909 and it, you see it everywhere but I was like but where's the catalog I want to see the catalog show me the catalog so I finally found this image in this article um, and it kind of gives you an idea of the types of pieces um, that they were presenting and then this and again as Kathy mentioned earlier very feminine I mean yes, just look at feminine. this piece this piece <laughs> here on the right um, well, so this piece here on the right was actually something we just sold. Oh. The only piece that I had that I could see in our recent archive, um, just doing a quick little search um, by Mappin and Webb, but you can see their their style is very delicate. And that piece is not a suffragette piece, but it was oh, okay. the same time period. So you can kind of imagine they might have made something similar in the colors. And so there was a lot of retailers jumping on the bandwagon being like, well, we're selling, you know, purple and green pieces and we're, we're for the movement. So, you know, wink, wink, you guys have a lot of income, come spend it with us. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's so delicate it's, and beautiful and flowers mm -hmm. and just wonderful pieces. Yeah. Um, that's beautiful. Well, yeah, it's gorgeous. Beautiful. And Emily, did you have one last slide? Um... Oh, sorry, this is sensitive. So the the last bit of information in terms of, as I said, I was having trouble defining what actually was a suffragette jewelry. I knew what it wasn't. Um, so a, a lot of the, there was a lot of publications that were in circulation among 
the suffragettes and a lot of them had, I guess, ads for individual artisans that were making pieces. They were selling their own homemade pieces to one another to raise money for the movement. Um, kind of like the pre the pre Etsy. The yeah, they were like, Etsy. hey, hey, buy this piece. And so one of the things that I found was um, in this kind of like one off little comment was that they were weaving their own beads at home. Someone had just patented like a, a bead weaving loom and you could also make your own with a cigar box and so you would go and you would buy beads by the pound in your favorite colors and you would weave your beads and so you can see on the left Miss Laura Ainsworth who's a, a noted suffragette she's wearing um, presumably her beads in the colors it's it was all about color and the images are black and white so you have to kind of you know, Use your imagination. Yeah, infer that they're probably wearing the colors because that was what they were all about. Um, and then on the right, it really, I believe that Miss Pankhurst, I think that is it's either Sylvia or Christabel. I think it's Christabel. Um, she, it looks like she's got pearls and a dark, there looks like there's two tones in that long strand that she's wearing. And I've seen that in several photos of her. I can only guess that that's, that's a homemade um, big long necklace full of purple, white, and green. <laughs> so yeah, it's, they're yeah. really cool. And so I found that really exciting. So they're making their own pieces, kind of how I've seen um, nods to when there was the when we were doing the Women's March several years ago. Everyone was making their hats. The you pink know, hats, yeah. The homemade, yeah, the homemade movement. Um, and it was a universal thing everyone jumped on, which I just think is great. Um, I want to, uh, before we run out of time here, I want to make sure we leave some time for questions. Um, so I want to make this point that the passage of the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote, but not all women. Um, the majority of women of color continue to face obstacles of voting, including local laws and poll taxes for decades after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, but we know that women of all races, including some really well-known figures in history, um, Harriet Tubman and Ida B. Wells, who was a journalist, were an integral part of the women's suffrage movement in the United States. So I wanted to ask you, Emily and Kathy, have you ever come across a piece of jewelry that references the contributions of women that women of color made to the suffrage movement in the United States? This I, I have not. I have okay. not. I have not physically gotten anything. I've been looking and I have not found anything um, pretty much as I as think a whole. <laughs> one thing I heard is they would wear lockets with mm -hmm. sentimental pictures in the lockets, but I still, I have not come across those either. Have you, Emily? Uh, um, no, I always look in, I always look in portraits to see what Pe what jewels people are wearing. I think we probably all do. And so and many yeah. of them adorn themselves, at all the different activists adorn themselves in different ways, but I have not found a specific piece that I could tie to the movement that was owned by an African-American woman. Um, um, Emily, I'm, I'm going to share my screen really quickly. I did, oh, yes. find, I did find one thing. It's not, um, it's not directly tied. So I reached out to the uh, the mu museum in Washington, D.C., the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I asked them, I explained them what we were doing today, and I asked them about, sorry, that's the wrong thing, um, I asked them about this, do you have any pieces, now I'm sharing my driver's license. <laughs> oh, this look is, at this that. Very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> this is very sensitive, you're right, Emily. Um, so I asked them, do you have any pieces in your archives, and I searched your archives online that have relate to black women's participation in the suffrage movement. And they said they couldn't find anything, but they did give me this and I wanted to share, I think this is a really beautiful pin and I wanted to share a little bit about the history behind this pin. So this is a pin for the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which was incorporated in the early 1900s, I think 1906. Um, the museum did not have an exact date for when this pin was made and it has no record of who made it. And it's just listed as being made of metal and enamel. Um, but it is known that it came from the family archive of Mary Church Terrell, uh, who was an activist for both civil rights and women's suffrage. And she was also, and this is very interesting, one of the first black women in the United States to earn a college degree. She went to Oberlin College in Ohio. 
She was one of the founders of the National Association of Colored Women's Club, and she was a charter member of the NAACP. So this pin came from her uh, collection. It came from her family archive. And this phrase that's on it, lifting as we climb, as seen here on the pin, that was the club's motto. So I just wanted to share that. Like I said, I did not, um, I did not, I'm sorry, I went off the pin there, but um, I did not, the museum did not have anything specifically related that said, you know, be involved in the suffrage movement, but I wanted to share that. Um, so I, like I said, it's about quarter to three now. I want to leave some time for questions. So Brecken, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Michelle, Emily, and Kathy for that fantastic and truly so interesting. That discussion was amazing. And thanks to our sponsor, RDI Diamonds. As a reminder, you can still type questions into the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many as possible um, over the next few minutes. While we compile the Q&A, I just wanted to say a quick word about RDI Diamonds. RDI Diamonds, the selection you want, the quality you need. Thousands of diamonds, that's just the beginning. RDI offers a wide range of services and support to help you succeed, from flexible memo options, a partnership with De Beers Group Industry Services, to generous stock options and cost-efficient shipping. RDI's goal is to provide the highest quality of both care and diamonds to your store. Visit rdidiamonds.com today to learn more. So now let's get on to our listener questions. Um, I'll just run through, I think, a few of the uh, that we had sent in, the first of which I think you guys touched a little bit on um, whether or not it was known who was making these pieces, but somebody wanted to know, was it women who was making this jewelry? Um, I think it was definitely a mix. There was a lot of women making the jewelry for themselves, um, including you know, the enamelist um, that made those beautiful pieces that we just saw. Mm -hmm. um, and they designed a lot of the pieces, including the Holloway brooch they designed and they had a company manufacture it for them. Um, and then there was also, I did see there was, you know, male led small firms that were, were making pieces for these women that we think were probably suffragist jewelries. Again, it was, we couldn't, it was hard to say for sure. Um, so it was definitely a mix. It, it didn't seem to be one sided. And I have come across, I've come across some suffragette jewelry made by Kremitz out of Newark, New Jersey, but that was mostly men. Okay. There. Yeah, it seems like the big firms were still mm -hmm. men, and then a lot of the independent crafts, craftsmen were women um, that were yeah. even in the movement themselves. Okay, very interesting. Which it seems like, you know, some things don't change. I feel like that's still like <laughs> yeah, a, a, a lot to do. <laughs> like, until, up until a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, the big companies are men, but then a lot of like the really look at innovative here we come. Here we come. designers are women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're still coming 100 years yeah. later. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brackhead. Um, and what are some good sources for genuine women's suffrage jewelry for people who might want to look for it now? I know you talked about how hard it can be. Um, one of the things what, you know, you know, I, I go to the antique jewelry show in Las Vegas, but that's it. Anyone that you deal with, I, I think as a jeweler, like any estate wholesaler, I let them know. They always know that's one of the first things I'm looking for. And as soon as they get it in, they know they can just ship it to me. I don't even need to see it. Just send it to me. And you just have to let them know that, you know, you're their, your go-to person for a suffragette mm -hmm. jewelry. Yeah, it makes sense. Just sort of establishing that relationship beforehand. Um, and who do you identify as contemporary suffragist jewelry designers? And, you know, what examples might you have of that? Ooh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. That that's... makes me want to, like, go do a bunch of research and, get, and come that's back to of... you. There's no one on the tip of my tongue. I know there's... Um, I feel like if you go on Instagram, there's a lot of very active um, collectors and designers um, that could each yeah. be considered, you know, someone of note, but there's no one specific that I'm thinking of right at this moment, but I'd love to follow up with that somehow. Great. Well, here's something sort of similar. Is there a jewelry style today that's rooted in suffragette jewelry? Sort of still mm. taking the same no, the patriot, 
the patriotic jewelry would be the closest thing. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the flag pins, anything red, white, and blue. I mean, patriotic, but the suffragette. Mm. I think also I, there's, I know many people that wear and make pins. I think the, the, the statement um, button pin will never cease to be a way to express yourself and your inclination yeah. um, in terms of, yeah, I'm trying to think of a specific example, but I definitely know, especially with like a younger, more artistic crowd who are more outspoken, it's definitely still alive and well. Um, and it continues, I think we'll continue. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I'll just finish with one more quick question. What was available for those who had more modest means at the time? I mean, I'd that say those a, buttons, right? I mean, yeah. those buttons, buttons would have been something that any, I mean, I don't know how much they cost. Emily or Kathy, you can jump in here. But I mean, the buttons would, I mean, it's just like today, right? Like, you, they were very inexpensive. Yeah, you can't necessarily afford a diamond necklace, but every everybody can go and you know, I think buttons today especially have kind of made a comeback as far as like expressing yourself or expressing different facets of pop culture that you like or your political views, whether it's feminism, whether it's for a certain political party. I think buttons have made a comeback. So I would say the buttons, right? I mean, obviously something like that necklace we saw in one of those last slides, that mm -hmm. was going to be, that's something that not, at, first of all, it's going to be hard to find. And if it is found, it's going to be expensive, but. Well, they used to sell the buttons for 10 cents, you know, in the 1900s, Ooh. they were 10 cents. Yeah. I think I saw like a, you could get other ones for a penny or something, but mm -hmm. I, I don't really have a grasp on the conversion. <laughs> so a lot more women, a lot more women wore these that were just concentrating on the uh, fine jewelry. But I think there was a lot more out there. Well, and also the, the ribbons and trimmings and all, all the different little bits of ephemera were yeah. ways that you could enhance what you were wearing um, with the colors. Right, sort of just the alternate materials in the same way people sort of swap out now. Okay, great. And the whole well, thing. well, I think we'll go ahead and stop it there. I'm sorry for all the questions we weren't able to get to, but I do want to thank again our guests, Emily and Kathy, for joining us in that amazing discussion and our host, Michelle, of course. You can tune in for another episode of My Next Question next Tuesday, October 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern, where our associate editor, Lenore Fido, will be interviewing jewelry designer Alexandra Lozier about gemstone legends and curses. You can read more about it and register at nationaljeweler.com slash webinars. I've just dropped the link into the chat now. Thanks so much again, everyone, for attending and joining us today, and please take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.